You will hear a conversation about a language course. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Borgheimer Language Courses. How may I help you? Oh yes, I contacted you some time ago about following a German course in Germany, and you advised me to take your placement test before we go any further. Well. I've done that now, so I'd like to go ahead with booking the course for this summer, if that's possible. Certainly, sir. You said you took the placement test. What was the result? I was placed at the O3 level. O3, right. That's lower intermediate. Fine, Mister. The answer is level three or lower intermediate. So the course level has been filled in for you. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Pettersen, John Pettersen. Could you spell that for me, please, Mr. Pettersen? P, E, double T, E R, double S O N. That's a double T and a double S. Am I right? That's right. Now, could I ask you where the course takes place? Well, we offer courses in Hamburg and Berlin. For your level, there's never a problem. There are always plenty of people for the intermediate classes. Oh dear, does that mean that there might be a lot of students in my class? I wouldn't be very happy about that. No, don't worry, Mr. Pettersen. The maximum class size is twelve, but I've never known there to be more than nine or ten in a class. It could even be five or six. Good. Actually, I'd prefer to study in Berlin. And how long is the course? Three weeks, five hours a day, two hours only on Saturday, Sundays free. I see. And what about accommodation? There you have a choice, Mr. Pettersen. You can either stay with a German family who are used to having such guests, or you can stay on the university campus, or we can book you into a nearby bed and breakfast. Is there a big difference in price? Not really. Staying with the family works out the cheapest, and the bed and breakfast is a bit more money. Staying on the university campus comes somewhere between the two price-wise, but Berlin is not too expensive anyway. Which do you recommend? Well, if you want to practice your German and be part of a German family, I would recommend staying with a family. Our families are all hand-picked, and we've never had any sort of complaint. Yes, I'll probably do that then. What are the dates of the course? The first summer course starts on the first of June in Hamburg, and a week later in Berlin, which is what would concern you as you have chosen the Berlin course. That's the eighth of June. The next course would begin on the second of July, and then the second of July course would be perfect for me. Can you put me down for it now? Certainly, Mr. Pettersen. Can I have your address, please? Twenty-six, Mayfield Drive, Orpington, Kent. I'm afraid I can't remember the postal code. Don't worry, Mr. Pettersen. I'll check on it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten.
Now listen and answer questions six to ten. There are a couple of other things I'd like to ask. Certainly. What do I need to bring on the course? Well, apart from the obvious, you'll need our textbooks. I'll email you the name and publisher. You should be able to find it in your local bookstore. If you do have problems, call me or email me, and I'll see what I can do. We provide the computers, computer discs, translation exercises, and all that sort of thing, but you will need a good dictionary. We recommend Langenscheidt, which is more than adequate for your level. You don't have to go and spend a lot of money on an expensive dictionary, not yet, anyway. Maybe you will when your German reaches a very high standard. That would be very nice. <laughs> Now, finally, what about the cost of the course, and how do I pay? Would you like to pay that in pounds or in euros? Euros would be fine. In that case, it's five hundred and fifty euros. You can pay by credit card if you like. Oh dear, I'm afraid I haven't got a credit card. How else can I pay? That's not a problem, Mr. Pettersen. You can pay by bank transfer. Fine. By the way, I forgot to mention I am a full-time student. Have you got a student card? Oh yes. Then that does make a difference. You'll be pleased to hear. You are entitled to thirty-five percent off the full price, and if you can persuade a few people to join you, it would work out even cheaper. How do you mean exactly? Well, for every five people you find, one goes free. In other words, if there are six of you, you get one free course. Of course, in reality, you would divide up the savings amongst you, presumably. Right. Well, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Thank you. Not at all, Mr. Pettersen, and I'm sure you'll enjoy the course. There are, of course, sightseeing possibilities. Would you like me to send you our brochure describing them? Yes, thank you. I'd appreciate that. Anyway, thanks for your help. If I want to call back, who do I ask for? Susanna. I'm here most of the time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a guide giving instructions to a group of international students in Canada, preparing for a whale watching trip. Before you hear the talk, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Hello, everyone. Glad to see so many happy faces on this wild and windy day. Are you all ready to go looking for whales? I'm Tony, and our other guide today is Dale. We'll be using these two rubber boats you see here, and our trip today will take three hours. In a few minutes, we'll be heading into part of the largest temperate rainforest of the Pacific Northwest. I'll show you our route on the map here. This is where we are now. We'll be leaving the sheltered bay and heading out across the mouth of the bay toward the open water. As you know, 
Last night there were strong winds in the area, so we can't go out into the ocean as we had planned. Near the mouth, the water will be quite rough. That's where we are most likely to spot orcas, or killer whales as they are also called. After crossing the mouth of the bay, we'll enter the calmer, shallower waters. This is where you look for gray whales. Then we will continue up this narrow inlet close to the shore. You will have a great view of giant fir and cedar trees that have never been logged. Here is the place to watch for wildlife. You are likely to see bears along the shore and eagles in the sky overhead. Right at the back of the inlet here are the hot springs where we will be stopping for an hour. You can have a soothing soak in bubbling hot water before the return trip. I'll tell you a little bit about the whales now because with the noise of the wind and the engine you won't be able to hear much out there. As we head out in the boat we will probably see dolphins first. They are a gray color and quite small, one to two meters long. They will swim right beside the boat racing along and sometimes jumping out of the water just ahead of us. They swim very fast, and they are playful and curious. They're really fun to watch. The next ones we'll see are orcas, or killer whales, which are actually members of the dolphin family. They are seven to eight meters long, very fast, and they have sharp teeth. Some stay in these waters all year round. We identify them by the distinctive black and white color. They feed mainly on salmon in these waters, but the orca diet can include seabirds, seals, dolphins, and other mammals. They can be fierce hunters, and this is why they are called killer whales. We should start watching for them as soon as we get out toward open water. We're likely to spot the orcas from a considerable distance. Watch for the black and white marking and mist spouting from the blowholes on top of their heads. Just outside the inlet is where we will probably see gray whales. The grays are migratory. They pass through here twice a year moving from far in the north where they feed to the warm southern waters where they breed. You are very lucky today because several have been reported in the area. Unlike the orcas, greys are solitary, except when you see a mother with a calf. The grey whales are much longer and heavier than the orcas, 14 meters long and weighing up to 30 tons. The grey whales are filter feeders, gathering tiny ghost shrimp from the sand at the bottom. We recognize greys from their tail fins because each one is different. Once we find the whales, we'll come up as close as we can safely. We are allowed to approach the whales no closer than 50 meters, but that feels pretty close when you are in the presence of animals this big. You'll see mist coming out of the blowholes when they breathe out, and you'll hear a loud hiss. If we are downwind, we might even be able to smell them, a strong, fishy smell. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now, as the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. Now, for just a few words of caution. It will be quite bouncy out there, especially in the front of the boat. If you want a smoother ride, stay in the middle of the boat, close to the engine. Hold on to the ropes and keep an eye on any big waves. Be alert so you don't get thrown out of the boat. In case of an emergency, you are all wearing survival suits. They'll keep you warm and dry in or out of the water. 
They are bright orange for visibility. The water temperature is around 8 degrees. Without these suits, you would only last a few minutes in this cold water. With these suits, your survival time is increased dramatically. They will keep you upright in the water even if you can't swim. But we don't expect anybody to end up in the water, so don't worry. Now, are there any questions? I'm afraid of getting seasick. Right. I was just coming to that. If you think you might get seasick, take one of these patches and put it on your arm at the wrist. Like this. It works on pressure points of the body and will relieve seasickness without the drowsiness you can get from pills. Are there any other questions? All right, then. Let's start loading up the boats. We leave in five minutes. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two friends discussing what to study at Mitchford University. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hello, Gloria. Hi, Paul. I just heard that you're studying psychology this year. At the moment, that's true. But to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what to study. You're in your third year at university. Do you have any advice for me? Well, it's a difficult question for me to answer, but I do have some ideas based upon my personal experience that may be of help. Anything would be helpful at this point. I'm feeling a little worried about what I should do. Well, there are a few things that I would recommend. Firstly, ask yourself, what do you really enjoy studying? For example, maths, English, science? This will help you decide what course you should do. The University Handbook lists all the courses available. You should take some time to look at it. A couple of my friends spoke with recent graduates of courses which took up a lot of time. Another thing which took a lot of time was an interview at the Dean of Academic Affairs office. They're always so busy there. Unless you've got a lot of time, I wouldn't bother with either of those ideas. Okay. Gloria, I understand there are some excellent publications that I can look at which will help answer my questions. But the trouble is, I'm having a real hard time locating them. Do you know where I might be able to go? Yes, I encountered this very same problem when I was deciding on what to study. I managed to locate a few excellent books that really helped me to decide what was best for me. Now some of the details will be a little inaccurate. That's no problem. If you could just remember the titles, I'll be able to look them up at the university library. Now, let me just get my pen. Uh, okay, ready? All right. The first book I found was What Should I Do? It was written by Paul Smith, and I believe it was published in 2000 by Smith Brothers. I think this was the best book I read, although Judy Newton's Choosing University Courses was also an excellent help for me. Can you remember what year that one was published? Hmm, let me see. Most of the books I read were published around the same year, 2000, I think. I can't remember who published it. I think it was Printers Limited. You'll have to check that one out yourself. No problem. This is just what I've been looking for. Anything else you could recommend? Yes. There was one other book which I remember because my cousin works for the publishers Brown and Tate. He started there in 2002. Anyway, the book's called Surviving University and was written by Julie White. 
It's an excellent book, which came out in 2004. I certainly recommend it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Gloria, this discussion has been so helpful. I wonder if I might ask one more question. Sure. What would you like to know? Well, I'm wondering why you finally decided to study psychology. Well, what helped me to decide was my interest in working with people. I think that's what you've got to really decide in your own mind. Do people give you energy, or do they drain you of energy? I asked my friends what they thought of my idea, and most of them thought it was a good choice. Yeah, you know, I think my parents or family members who know me well would be a good place to start. Hmm. I think if you like to research subjects, you might prefer to work by yourself. That could help you to decide what area you should study. For me, I like working with numbers, and I knew psychology involved a lot of this, so that also helped me to choose my course of study. The bottom line is, you've really got to know what you naturally like to do. Once you work that out, you simply choose areas of study that relate to those things. Well, Gloria, I can't thank you enough for your time. Would you be interested in joining me for a coffee? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. I'd like to go over some simple security measures today. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello, everyone. I'd like to go over some simple security measures today. As you all know, there have been a few small incidents with students' possessions being lost or stolen. And as the student representative for Middlesex Hall of Residence, I'd like to remind everyone of a few simple things we can do to make our accommodation safer for everyone. And to remind everyone of the security measures already in place. First of all, I'd like to go over what security measures are already in or around the halls of residence. As you turn off the road into Middlesex Hall, there is a security barrier for people arriving by car. Students or anyone else, for that matter, have to report to security through the speaker before they can even enter the car park. Once they're in the car park, we have CCTV, that's closed circuit television, linked directly to the security office, so that anyone coming into the front entrance via the car park can be seen by the person on duty. We also have cameras around the hall of residence. The film from the CCTV is kept by security in case there is a problem and we need to send the film to the police to help identify the person. So barriers and CCTV. In addition to these, there is security lighting in the car park and around the hall of residence, which is on from night to morning. 
These security measures are there to help, but the really important thing is the front entrance. At the front entrance is a keypad lock. Now, as you all know, to open this, you need your student card and the four-digit security code. As you also know, you should not give this code to anyone you do not know, and you should never let anyone into the Hall of Residence. Remember that for all the security measures we take, if you let someone into the hall, then anything we do to keep students' possessions safe will not help. After the front door, we have the reception desk. Now, this is manned 24 hours a day, but the security guard has a lot to do and may not be there all the time. If you need to call security, go to the nearest phone or call on your mobile. The number is 966 and they will be with you as soon as they can. The next thing I want to mention are your own personal security measures. By this I mean the locks on your room door and window, your personal alarm and the university bus. All student rooms have a swipe lock that we open with our student cards. Do not leave your room door unlocked if you're going out for a long period of time and do not leave your card in a place where someone can pick it up and enter your room. This is, of course, common sense, but people still leave their rooms unlocked and still leave their cards around. The next thing is your room window. Everyone has a key for their window and everyone should try to keep their windows locked when they are out of the building. However, the security guard has told me that he often finds windows open and even worse, he finds windows open on the ground floor. Please don't do this. It's an invitation to a burglar to enter the hall and take people's things. Finally, two more items, personal alarms and the university bus. Now, the Students' Union gives every student their own personal alarm if you go to collect it. A personal alarm is something that gives out a loud noise if you press it when you think you may be in danger. It lets people know where you are and that you need help. The second thing you can do is use the university bus. It takes students from the campus to the town and to other places on campus. It goes every half an hour and it's free, so please try to use it, especially after dark. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.